Matthew chapter 11, with this uh, thought of coming unto the Lord, coming unto the Lord. Matthew chapter 11, find your place, please stand with me, we'll read verses 28 through 30, <clears throat> been our starting point for the last week or so, probably will be for a couple more. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28 through 30, Bible says this, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Father, I thank you for the word of God this evening. I pray that you'd help us to see the truth in it. I know we won't get through everything that's uh, going on in these three verses. But Lord, I pray tonight we take away some things of understanding that we can rest and rely upon you, Father. And I pray that we would truthfully do that. I pray that we would find rest in you, just as much rest as we have for our eternal salvation. Lord, that we can have this rest in our labor as long as we labor for you. Father, help me tonight, guide my words, and I pray your blessings upon it. I pray that we would certainly all look to you and that we would glorify you. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we got the word of God. You're the reason for anything, Lord, in this life, and we thank you for it, God. I pray that we would, as we just sang also, all be surrender to you. Lord, what could you do with us if we would just be wholly 100% given over to you, Lord? That's all you're asking for. I pray we'd yield to that. Lord, you're blessed tonight. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Appreciate you standing to be seated. Last week, we talked about out of Hebrews of, of true eternal rest. True rest eternally uh, and spiritually and physically is given to the Lord. Now, that only comes if we seek it and move towards it, right? So, so when you think about that eternal rest we talked about when we preached last week, but just because we hear the gospel, just because we understand what the gospel is, it doesn't mean that we have rest, right? We have to uh, hear it, and then we have to make a decision to move forward with that to accept that rest. Uh, people today are frantic in the world. I'm talking about people that are religious are very frantic in the world today because they have no idea what is what their eternal rest will be like they, they don't have any ideas in that and so you talk to people who think they can lose their salvation and you talk to people that are trying to earn their salvation they don't have any rest they don't know what sin's gonna to uh, take their salvation away they don't know all the good works that's going to be good enough for them to earn their way into heaven they don't have any rest but truthfully we understand eternal rest that we have because it is the ceasing of work, right? When, when work stops, that's rest. That's what we discussed last week. And we remember that our works for salvation are nil. <laughs> there are none. You can't work your way to heaven. It's all by a faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He did all the work for us, therefore we can rest in Him for salvation. And then we rest in the promise of that hope that we have of eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we see the rest that's there. Look in with me, Titus chapter 3. Flip over to Titus, uh, just as a couple reminders here. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. I just want to remind us that uh, rest is ceasing from work, and all our work has been finished in the work of Jesus Christ, his work. Titus chapter 3, verse 3 through 7. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diver lust, divers lust. Okay, I'm getting feedback on this thing, not sure why. He says, For we ourselves uh, were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lust and pleasures, living in malice uh, and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. That being justified by his grace, we shall be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So again, our rest is in the finished work of Jesus Christ. In other words, Jesus did it all. And when we realize that and we accept that and we believe that, so we hear it, we understand it, we trust that. The moment that we trust that, we can have eternal rest in Jesus Christ. That's the eternal rest that we talked about last week because the work has been done by the Lord Jesus Christ, no more for us. It's impossible for us to work enough, to be good enough, to follow his word enough, to earn salvation. It is given by faith. It is the grace gift of God. 
the work has been done. Praise the Lord for that. So we talked about that last week. Now, because we've been saved, it doesn't mean we just to go home, we get to go home and just rest. It doesn't mean that we just get to do whatever we want to do with our lives. That's not the kind of rest that we're talking about because there is still work to be done for the believer. Now, get what I said, work to be done for the believer. There's not work to be done to become a believer. That's been done in Jesus Christ. But now that we're saved, there is work to be done in the believer. We even see that in Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Look at me real quick. The Bible says this. It's still doing it, Cade. Is this thing still on? I'm talking about the pulpit mic. Maybe that's it. Okay. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. He says, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every what? Good work. Good work. So once we're saved, we're born again, right? God has a purpose for us, as we saw in Matthew several weeks ago, and that's to let our light shine. Why? So that the world may see the good works of the Lord Jesus Christ in us. So he says, be ready to every good work. This mindset of a believer being saved and done and living the way that they want to do is absolutely evil and sinful. It's evil and sinful. Who are we to take the eternal grace gift of God and then say, thank you, God, for giving me a home in heaven, and now I'm going to live life the way that I want to live it? That's not the rest that we're talking about when we look at it in Matthew chapter 11. The rest that we have for eternal security, sure, is done in the work of Jesus Christ. But now we have to have a mindset of being a servant for the Lord. We do work. We serve. We show the world His good works in us. How? By living out the Word of God in our life. Now, that brings up a problem that a lot of people have. And that's what we're talking about in chapter Matthew. In chapter Matthew. In Matthew chapter 11. Because what does he say? Come unto me, come unto me, all ye that labor. So there's laboring to be done, right? There's work to be done. But this is what happens when we step away from God and try to do the work ourselves. We get tired, we get frustrated, we get annoyed, we don't see results. We have all of these issues because we're trying to do it in our own power. That's not what God wants. God has never designed this life to be done in our own power. Yes, we have free will. Yes, we get the opportunity to decide to obey or not to obey. And God gives us health to be able to go out and do what we need to do, right? But we don't go out doing something that's unbiblical. Let me give you an example. There are a thousand ways that we could come up with in our mind of presenting the gospel to individuals, okay? Um, I'll just use one that just popped into my head, but... I'm not going to say, okay, come to Anchor Baptist Church for a free beer. And everybody shows up for a free beer. And we got the whole place packed out because we probably would. And then we're like, all right, we're going to give you the gospel. That's not God's design. We don't have bingo night, right? We don't say, well, we're going to bring bingo night in so we can get 1,000 people in here. And then we're going to get them the gospel. That's not how it works. I'll be quite honest with you. I don't see anywhere in Scripture. I'm not against events. And special days. I'm not against it, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But I don't see anywhere in that Bible that says you have to have some type of a something to bring people into the church. Every verse in that Bible tells us to what? Go into the world. This is a place to be fed. This is a place to serve. Absolutely, the church can still present the gospel when people come. But don't misunderstand this misconception idea that we have to do all of these fambabulous things to try to trick people into getting into the house of God using secular reasons to get them to the gospel. Everybody make sense? It's our job to go into the world, period. That's it. You'll never find it anywhere in Scripture. So we begin to get frustrated because we want to apply secular ideas, worldly principles, carnal ideas to try to do what God tells us to do biblically in a different way. Right? There's nothing wrong with breaking the ice and starting a conversation with a purpose. I mean, with a person. But God doesn't tell us we have to talk about sports to give the gospel. 
God doesn't tell us we have to talk about politics to give the gospel. God doesn't tell us we have to do these things to make a relation with those individuals to give them the gospel. Just telling them about Jesus is exactly what the scripture tells us to do, and I promise you will be enough. Yes, be friendly. Yes, be loving. I understand all those things. There's nothing wrong with them. But we get this mindset, I have to talk about these things, then I can introduce the gospel. And truth be told, many times when we talk about those things, that generally is the majority of the conversation. And we try to squeeze in Jesus' name or squeeze in the gospel really quick. And then we wonder why it doesn't work out. We wonder why the events don't work out. We wonder why when I try to do things in my own power, they don't work out. Because we're missing the whole point of verse 28. We didn't come unto him. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We have to do this thing the way the Lord tells us to do it. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7. Look over with me. Because when we do it in ourselves, we are going to fail. It's impossible. We feel like it's too hard. I don't know how it happens, but burn out of being a Christian, and then we get to the place that we just want to quit. Because I haven't come to the Lord. I haven't allowed his yoke to be, I haven't given him the power, I haven't given him the authority, I keep trying to do it in my own power. Paul dealt with the same thing, Romans chapter 7, if you're there, look with me in verse 18. Paul says this, well we'll start in 17, he says, Now then it is no, no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. Now I'm going to pause for a minute. Paul says that in my flesh dwells no good thing. Now this proposes a big problem, right? Paul's a preacher. Paul's a proclaimer of the gospel. Paul's a church planner. Paul's a discipler. Paul is training men to be in the ministry. Paul is assisting other churches. Paul is helping other evangelists. You with me? Paul is still a person and he's still a human being. Would it be safe to say that Paul might have had some ideas in his uh, experience in life on how things could be done? Let me let's just be obvious tonight. Paul could have went and said, let me show you how not to get arrested. Right? But Paul never changed anything. And what happened? He got arrested. He got beaten. He got thrown in, in prison. He got persecuted. What did he do when he went to the next town? The same thing. What are you doing in the next town? The same thing. What are you doing when in the next town? The same thing. I'm just saying if we sat Paul down man to man and said, okay, Paul, don't you think there's a different way you might be able to go into the town? Maybe we can go incognito and we just uh, not go straight to the synagogue. Maybe we could just go to the church and say we're having pumpkin night and just get some people in and not tell the Jews that you're here, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to be funny, but we certainly could have come up with a secular mindset that wouldn't have put Paul in prison. But you know what Paul did? Paul said, no, 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 this is what the Lord called me to do. I'm going to trust him. And if i got to go into the town and be beat and go to every jail in every town, so be it. I'm going to continue to do this the way that God taught me. I'm going to continue to do this the way that God commanded me. But he recognized, if I do this as Paul, it's flesh. And he says in verse 18, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. He had this inner turmoil going on. He knew it was right, but in the flesh, he knew if he did it in the flesh, it would be complete failure. Verse 21. He says, I find in a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. Now, you say, what do you mean, Paul? Are you 100% holy, perfect, and righteous? Nobody in this room is 100% holy, perfect, and righteous. In the spirit you are, right? Because when you die, the spirit goes back to God who created it. So the spirit that's been born again is 100% holy, perfect, and righteous. But you are not. You're flesh. You with me? You're still you. And you still have this battle of how I want to do it compared to how God wants me to do it. Let me just, in the context of what we're trying to say, we still have this battle that we think, well, I can do this so I don't have to come unto the Lord. Paul says, listen, there's a law. That means it's not a theory. 
when I do good, evil is present. There's evil. Why is that? Because I'm still a human being. It's still me. He says, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Paul says, how in the world am I going to do this? I know I'm saved. I know the spirit of God's within me, but I also know that I'm Paul. I'm saved. I know that I'm going to heaven, but I'm still Dean Francini. What in the world am I going to do? Verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. You see what he's saying here? If I yield to the Spirit, if I yield to the Word of God, then I can do this thing according to God's plan. I know it seems like we always hear the same thing over and over and over, and i got to be reminded of it as well. And I will back it up with the fact that Paul even told Timothy, make sure you put these things in remembrance. So we do need to be reminded of the simple truths of the Word of God, right? This is what Paul's saying. If I will yield to the instruction of that Bible, and I will live my life, and I will serve God according to that Bible, despite the evil that's within me, because I'm still in the flesh, if I yield to following this, then I will do it God's way. But the moment I think that I can do it outside of this, going to lead to frustration, going to lead to anger, going to lead to burnout, going to lead to want to quit. Because you can't do it. Now, isn't that crazy? The turmoil that we go through, I, honestly, I bet if we put down a list one time of all the things that we have done that we know didn't work for those in the Old Testament and we know it didn't work for the saints uh, in the New Testament, it's black and white in Scripture, this did not work. How many times have we tried to do the exact same things that they've done? We're just as foolish. Why? Because we're flesh. We're flesh. And when we do anything in our own flesh, it's toil it's uncomfortable, it's unsuccessful, it's going to lead to frustration. It has to be as we yield to the Spirit of God following the instruction of the Word of God. Look with me in Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I'm just happy I didn't put her to sleep tonight. I put her to sleep the last three messages, so... She's awake for this one. Luke chapter 5. Jesus shows up to a lake, the lake of Gennesaret. Gennesaret. Two ships there, and he thinks it's, uh, I'm sorry, he doesn't think. He knows it's going to be time for him to give a message. So he gets into one of the ships, which was Peter's. Simon's, it tells us in verse 3. He says, hey, push us off here a little bit, and uh, I'm going to teach me a lesson. So he teaches a lesson, and gets done with the lesson in verse 4. I want to pick up in verse 5. Actually, we'll just pick up in verse 4. He says, now then he had left speaking. So he had taught the message. He had taught to the individuals. Peter's in the boat with him. And I'm going to jump ahead and then come back because it's, there's a big point in this. Peter had been working all day long. Try to be careful how I say this. Sometimes we can get in the flesh to make decisions because we're tired in the flesh. So Peter's been fishing. All day. We're going to see that in just a moment. Matter of fact, he's taking a break from fishing. Jesus shows up. They were busy cleaning the nets. We'll see that in a moment too. Jesus tells Peter, who's been busy all day, fishing all night, cleaning his nets, push the boat back out. So he obeys him, pushes the boat back out. Jesus teaches a lesson. We don't know what that lesson is. He said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drop. So he gets done teaching. He's finished. Now he says, Peter, let's go out here a little bit further and let's let down the nets. Now look at me in verse 5. Simon answering said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night. What does that mean? Peter and the boats have been 
working the bones, working the finger off their bones. Throwing the net out, bringing the net in. Throwing the net out, bringing the net in. Throwing the net out, bringing the net in. All night long, the Bible says. So they toiled all the night. Now I want you to see context here of what we're talking about because we labor sometimes, probably more than we should, in the flesh instead of in the Holy Spirit yielding to the Bible. So they've toiled all night and have taken nothing, the Bible says. Nevertheless... What's those next three words? At thy word. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now I want you to pause for a minute and think with me. This is nothing in the message. But what did Jesus grow up doing? What was his trade? He was a carpenter. He wasn't a fisherman. He was a carpenter. Okay. Now he's not a carpenter. He's what? He's a preacher. Nope, he's a preacher. He's teaching and preaching, right, the word of God. So he went from carpenter to teacher and preacher, okay? What's Peter's livelihood? What's Peter? He's a fisherman. What's Peter done his whole life? He's been a fisherman. What's, bus- what's the business that Peter owns? A fishing business. So you got a carpenter teacher telling the fisherman what to do, all right? And I know we overlook that many times, but that's the truth of it. Not only is he telling the fisherman what to do, that fisherman's tired, The Bible said he toiled all night long, caught nothing. So he's physically tired, and we can presume he's probably a little mentally fatigued because this is his livelihood. He's made no money that night. He hadn't caught a fish. He can't sell anything. And now he's got this carpenter teacher saying, why don't you just push this boat out a little bit and drop your net? Now, I thank God that Peter didn't argue with the Lord. There's no... Discussion about the thing. Besides, he wants to let Jesus know that he ain't caught nothing all night. But he says this. At thy word, I will let down the net. Let me pause for a minute. Sometimes we toil in soul winning. We toil in trying to witness to people. We toil in trying to understand the gospel. We toil with this life. We struggle with this life. And I think if we took a moment and took a a pause... And said, okay, what is at thy word? Maybe I'm doing this thing in my own power. Maybe there's something in this Bible that tells me how to do what I'm supposed to be doing. Doesn't the Bible teach us how to raise our kids? Doesn't the Bible teach me how to treat my wife? Doesn't the Bible tell me how to take care of my husband? Does it, not mine, talking in general. Doesn't the Bible tell me what to do with my finances? Doesn't the Bible tell me... With me, the Bible does tell us these things in life, and what happens is we step away from this and we toil, we struggle with this flesh, and we get to the place that Peter said, I'm sorry, Paul said, Oh, wretched man that I am, what in the world is going on? Oh, I'm flesh and I'm sinful, and I haven't yielded to the spirit. I haven't surrendered all. I haven't given this over to let the Lord lead me in this. I've been trying to do this and do this and do this, and I haven't come to Jesus. I'm the one that's laboring. I'm the one that's heavy laden. I'm the one that's burdened down. And I'm continuing to do it and do it and do it and do it and do it. And Jesus says, come unto me. They've toiled. Peter's toiled all night long. Jesus says, why don't you go ahead and let this thing down? So Peter says, at thy word. In other words, he's recognizing the instruction that Jesus is giving to him. And he says, okay, I'm going to obey your command. Verse 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. Now stop for a minute. Jesus gave him everything to do. Did he not? He did. Look at the instruction Jesus gave him. He said, Simon, launch out into the deep. So Jesus said, take your boat and go to deep water. Then he told him, let down your nets. Jesus gave him the exact instruction on what to do. Now, had Peter stayed in the shallow or Peter would have thrown out some chum, who knows? If Peter would have done something different, then he wouldn't have been obedient to God. He said, move the boat to deep water, put the net down. Peter did exactly that. Peter said, okay, at thy word, we're going to go out here to deep water and I'm going to put the net down. And what happened? There's no more toiling. The net is full of fish, so much that it break. 
When they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break, and they beckoned unto their partners, which were in the other ship, that they should come and help them. And they came and filled both the ships so that they began to sink. No more toiling. They just simply obeyed the word of Jesus Christ, and he provided for them how, when, and the fish. He gave them everything they needed. Jesus told Peter where to go. How many times do we get in a place in our life and we say, now what? Now what? I've got myself in the sling. I've got myself in a rut. I've made this bed. Now what? I don't know what to do next. Well, we all have a Bible. We all have a pastor. We all have a preacher. We all have teachers. We all have other brothers and sisters in Christ. We have a church at Anchor Baptist Church that we can come together. There's uh, safety in a multitude of counselors, Right? What are all those for? At thy word. Right? If you're counseling somebody or giving instruction or encouragement, it ought to be related to the word of God. Right? You ought to be able to come to a place where you can hear the word of God. You ought to take some time, some priority in your life to see what the word of God says. Right? In all areas of our life. Because he will give us the who, what, where, when, and how. Just as he did for Peter. That is the come unto me. All ye that labor are heavy lady, laden, and I will give you rest. Strength in the flesh is not coming to Christ. Toiling in the flesh is not coming to Christ. At thy word, following his command, is coming to Christ. And trusting that Jesus will provide the results. That Jesus will resolve the situation for you. As he did for Peter. They had no money. They had no fish. But they did after they listened to the Lord. They weren't toiling anymore. It was so full that both the ships began to sink. And you know what all this led to? Look at verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down on Jesus' knees, and, uh, Jesus' knees, saying, depart from, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. We struggle in this life Many times we even know what to do, but we still continue to try and try and try and try. It's amazing when we finally say, okay, God, what do you want me to do? And when God resolves that in your life, you ought to be thankful. You ought to be humble. You ought to be encouraged, right? Peter recognizes the sinfulness within himself when he sees what God has provided for him. And you know when he falls at the, at, the, at the feet of Jesus and he says, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. He's yielding himself to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's realizing who he is compared to the Holy God. And God provided. We either believe the word of God or we don't. We either trust the word of God or we don't. These aren't just stories that are concocted together. These are truths for the purpose of us to apply in our lives and build our life around. He gave them fish, not some fantasy. He gave them fish, and they toiled not. It's a great application to what we see in Matthew. Verse 11, And when they had brought their ships to land, they forsook all and followed him. Jesus is teaching disciples, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now, I'm not saying that God's calling every one of us to be full-time ministry, if you want to use those terms, fishers of men, but I am telling you that God has called you to be fishers of men. <laughs> it's all of our jobs to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, no doubt about it, right? But what I want you to take away from this and understand is that if we will yield to him, if we will allow him to direct, lead, and guide us, he will provide for us. He'll do it. He has to. He has to fulfill, as Jesus is teaching his disciples there, because God's not a liar. So we can either toil all night, we can get frustrated in the decisions that we're making and continuing to do things over and over and over. Or we can listen, because he's calling us to labor. We all have to labor. But we're to do it with him, trust him, and yield to him. And it starts by coming to him. Come unto me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
If we never take the step, we're going to continue to toil, toil and struggle. But if we'll take the step, we won't have to feel wore out. We won't have to continue in frustration. We won't have to get tired. We're probably those things because we're doing it in the flesh and not in the spirit anyway. So I'd ask you tonight, what does the word of God say about what you're doing? The decisions that you make in life, what does the Bible say about it? Are you doing it your way? Or have you come unto Jesus to follow the way that the Bible tells you to do it? Maybe you're frustrated with your finances. Come unto me, he'll show you. Maybe you're frustrated with trying to reach a loved one uh, that you're trying to get the gospel to, but maybe you're just a little spooked and, and just giving it to them via scripture. I don't know. Come unto me. Maybe you're struggling with a relationship. Come unto me. Maybe you're struggling. Whatever it is in your life, why would we not come unto him who will provide? He provided for Peter. He'll provide for you. But he'll never do it until you come unto him. So you can labor in your own power or you can labor in the power of God. You can get frustrated by doing it in the flesh or you can yield to the spirit. You can try to see results in your own power and you'll never get it. Or you can just allow God to provide the results for you. But you have to make the decision to come to him. You have to make the decision to yield to him. You have to recognize flesh dwelleth no good thing. Spirit dwelleth all good things. The decision's ours. We can be like Peter. Peter could have told the Lord, nah, I fished all night. You just make docks. I make fish. This thing will happen. I'm going to go back and go home. Right? But he didn't. At thy word, come unto me. Jesus promises to give us rest. Father, I thank you for the precious word of God tonight. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to seek it, understand it, truthfully allow it to lead our lives. Father, there's no doubt we get frustrated in the things of this life and in this world because we continue to do them in our own power. And when we do that, we're going to fall. We're going to falter, Lord. We're going to slip. We're going to fall flat on our faces. And God, we're going to get frustrated. That's where the devil wants us to be. The devil wants us to be frustrated. The devil wants us to second guess. The devil wants us to say and to doubt you, Lord. The devil wants to say, hey, don't just trust. You've got to do this. God gave you strength. God gave you a brain. God gave you power. You have a body. Just go do it yourself. Try this. Try that. Try it the world the way. That's what the devil keeps throwing at us, the principalities and the spirits of this world. But, Lord, what we've seen tonight is no doubt that we have to yield unto you. We have to yield. We have to say, Lord, in this flesh dwelleth no good thing. And, Lord, I recognize that if I do it in my flesh, I'm going to fail. So, Father, I'm coming to you. I'm yielding myself to you. Spirit of God, lead me. Show me. Give me the verse. Give me the message. Give me the person, whatever I need, so that I don't continue to toil, but yield to you, because that's where rest is. That's where the providence will come from. That's where the success is. That's where the comfort of life comes from, Lord, as I give myself over to you, Father. May we learn from Peter tonight and truly trust you at your word, Father to find it for our life. And I wonder tonight, truthfully, is what we're doing connected to the word of God or is what we're doing connected to what we want? Help us, Lord, to decipher these things, discern these things in our lives that we can find the rest and we can find the power and we can find the success that we need in our life to live for you, Father. Please keep us safe. Watch over us as we travel out, Lord. I pray you help us in all areas of our life, God. I know there are things on our hearts that we don't always share, but you know them unspokens, Lord, you know them. People that are dealing with sickness, those that are traveling, Father, you know all of that. I pray we yield it all to you, trust you for the best. Keep us safe as we head home tonight. We ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen and amen.